from MTN News, this is Montana This Morning. The COVID infection crisis in Montana worsening. Coming up, see how hard it's hitting some of the state's smallest hospitals. I'm Mike Dennison in Helena. Coming up, we examine the GN Forte administration's response to the current surge in COVID-19 cases in Montana. It is 6.30 on this Friday. Chet Lehman, Matt Elwell, I don't know why I'm using my <laughs> overnight radio voice, but I was, that's what we're going to do. Gonna we're going to clear we're my calm voice it down morning, yeah. for the next uh, half hour. Good morning, folks. <laughs> Uh, too, hey, you're going to need your coat. <laughs> Must have been morning. that candy pumpkin yeah. I just ate. Is that what it was? I think so, yeah. yeah. It doesn't taste like pumpkin. That's why I ate it. <laughs> Those things are disgusting. They're like candy corns. I love candy corn. I know you don't like that either. I don't, yeah. but you don't like pumpkins. So <laughs> that there we are. Apparently, I need to move on. Temperatures into the <laughs> 20s and 30s for the morning. A uh, little chilly in the morning. You do need to keep that coat pretty close at hand. There are some patchy fog areas, mainly those uh, low-lying areas in the riverbeds and those areas. We've had a lot of melting, so there's a lot more moisture out there uh, in our skies. Temperatures should be into the upper 40s by the mid-afternoon in Bozeman. We'll probably hit the 50s for um, Butte into the afternoon. We've got a great weekend forecast, and I'm going to talk about drought conditions, of course, uh, coming up here in a little over 12 minutes. That's perfect. You and I have the cosmic balance. I'll eat the candy ones, you eat the real run. That's perfect. And we'll all be happy. 631, our top story <laughs> this half hour, COVID-19, putting a huge amount of pressure on Montana's smaller hospitals. Dan's Janelle Slade shows us one that's struggling to deal with the crisis. The influx of COVID-19 and the added pressure it's put on our hospitals and their teams has pushed its way out into our smaller Montana communities as well. Here in Columbus, just one staff person down can make a huge impact on the entire hospital. So the community is stepping in to help. A jalapeno steak. Yes, thank you. Pastor Josh Daniels is serving his community in a different way today. Aaron, how are you doing, sir? I believe you owe me some money for a big fat lunchbox burrito. He's taking orders and collecting cash at the Stillwater Billings Clinic. We've been running at a higher census than we have in many, many years. With the COVID medical crush in Billings, new Stillwater CEO Luke Kobold says for the last few weeks, this 16 bed facility has been operating near capacity. We're seeing some patients being transferred from there to our facility because we have an appropriate level of care and uh, it's helping to ease the burden since both of those hospitals and buildings are on divert. Oh. So you're out this way? Nope, we're out the front. So like other hospitals, the clinic in Columbus is in need of more medical and cleaning staff. But when it lost a full-time dietary employee, the kitchen chose to close for employees to focus on feeding patients. Yeah, last week we got to deliver coffees to everybody. And that's where Pastor Josh, some behind the scenes employees and the community come in. For the last couple weeks, local businesses and area food truck owners have been donating or giving discounts on food, while other days, the members of the Columbus Evangelical Church have hosted potlucks. From what I understand, just it's hard for them to get away even for five minutes to get anything to eat and not to mention to try to run across town to find food. You know, they don't have time. How are you guys doing? Cool. Good. Today's run is to pick up and bring back breakfast burritos from the big fat lunchbox. They've been doing a, a great job with all of the challenges that they have over there. So any way that we can can help them out and help them get through with what they're dealing with and the stresses that they're dealing with, we just want to be a part of that. For them to be able to uh, have food brought right to them has just been a huge blessing. Jalapeno steak, it says? Oh, you are a glutton for punishment here. The, the smiles on their face, just the excitement that they have. It's been huge. Steak burrito. Boy, you're a lucky man. Those are good ones. In Columbus, Janelle Slade, MTN News. Here's what it looks like in the state uh, as of the latest numbers. Gallatin County, the second highest number of new COVID cases in Montana. Yellowstone County leads. Uh, Gallatin County is followed by Missoula Butte. Silver Bowl County currently eighth, but with just 40 new cases compared to Gallatin County at 149. 1,300 new cases reported statewide in the past 24 hours. 15 counties in the state reporting zero new cases, including Beaverhead. 54% of the eligible population has been vaccinated in Montana. And there are 13 additional deaths in the latest report, which includes one in Madison County. Well, new COVID-19 cases and hospitalizations are continuing to surge here in the Treasure State, placing us among the highest in the nation per capita in both categories. 
The surge data also are uh, rivaling the numbers that Montana hit during last fall's peak wave of COVID-19 prior to the release of vaccines in January. So how is Governor Greg Gianforte's administration responding to the surge? And how does his response compare to actions taken last year by his predecessor, Governor Steve Bullock? TN's chief political reporter, Mike Dennison, spoke to people who've worked closely on the issue during both times and tells us what he learned in the first of this two-part series. As the COVID-19 pandemic unfolded last spring and summer, then-Governor Steve Bullock invoked a state of emergency, closed schools, temporarily restricted public gatherings, and mandated face masks in many public places. Yet COVID numbers still surged in the fall, hitting almost 1,000 new cases a day last November and 312 deaths, the highest of any month so far in Montana. Jim Murphy was a state epidemiologist under Bullock and Gianforte until this June when he retired. He says while Bullock's orders faced resistance in some locales, Montana fared better on infections, deaths, and hospitalizations than neighboring states that didn't invoke similar restrictions last year. So when you compare the rates for those states, we know that the measures that were put into place in Montana worked. You know, had Montana public health folks and the governor's office not stepped forward to do those things, things would have been much, much worse than they were, and they were bad enough. Bullock also held frequent news conferences on his pandemic plans, fielding questions from reporters and sharing the stage with key health staff, hospital officials, and others. Greg Holtzman was state medical officer under Bullock and a key advisor last year. He made it very clear in the beginning he wanted to be transparent. He knew that things would be a little mucky because things were just changing so quickly. Ellen Leahy, the longtime public health director in Missoula County until she retired this summer, says local health officers weren't always in the loop initially and sometimes disagreed with Bullock's directives. But she says he left them some flexibility to implement those rules and provided visible leadership when the state needed it. So to have the governor, the top elected official, show that leadership sent so many um, nonverbal messages says, hey, this is important. Hey, we are all one state. But at the same time, he would always say, sometimes we didn't like it, but he would always say, talk to your local health department. Gianforte became governor in January as the pandemic was still raging, but vaccines were on the horizon. Health officials generally give Gianforte good marks for prioritizing the vaccine rollout and personally encouraging Montanans to get vaccinated against COVID-19. Yet, as this year has unfolded and COVID-19 cases and hospitalizations surged anew in Montana, they say actions or inactions by the governor and his administration are not always what they consider helpful. There were a number of bills that he signed off on that made really drastic changes to our local control public health system in the state. It took away fundamental tools for times just like this and did it in the midst of a pandemic, which um, it, I think was reckless. We'll talk about some of those laws and actions tomorrow. We'll also hear from Gianforte's top health official on just how the administration is responding to that criticism and to the recent surge in COVID-19 cases. Reporting from Helena, Mike Dennison, MTN News. By the way, on Thursday, Montana reported 1,300 new COVID uh, cases of COVID-19. That's the 25th time in the last 27 days daily report. The amount has exceeded 1,000 cases. In other news, Bozeman Police Department has three new officers. The newest members of the police department are all lateral, or lateral officers, which means they've had previous experience working in a different police department. Officer De Mercurio joins from Northern California. Officer Dietz from Minnesota. Officer Capalong joins from Belgrade. Now, during a ceremony uh, last evening, Bozeman Police emphasized the importance of community and how that serves a central role in being a police officer here in Bozeman. Is these are three quality individuals, right? We've done everything we can to vet them and make sure that they're a good fit for this community, that they share our values. And I really look forward to, to getting them on the street and being productive members of the community. By the way, the newest officers sworn in by City Manager Jeff Mihalik. They will uh, undergo 14 weeks of training before they're put out onto the streets of Bozeman. Well, Bozeman is home to the state's largest university, the Museum of the Rockies, and an ever-increasing number of residents. Turns out, none of that would have happened without the settlement of an area well north of town. 
we recently visited the Reese Creek area where efforts are underway to save its community center one shingle at a time. That's Bozeman, one of the fastest growing communities in the nation. Growth continues to swell across all of the Gallatin Valley, but none of that would have happened without this community, nestled up against the Bridgers a long way from downtown. It's true, and Reese Creek was the first settlement in Gallatin County, but it was the center of activity here, and the school rallied as a place for people. I mean, grandparents went to school here, parents went to school here, and then their children went to school here, and people got married here. It was the center of the community. This structure was built in 1904 at the whopping cost of $452.50. There was also a teacherage, and this became the center of activity while Bozeman began its growth spurt down in the valley. Uh, first they started in a log cabin, and then when they built the school, they moved into the school. And so my dad's parents uh, both had attended school here, and then later married, and they had their family and stayed in the community. Mm -hmm. And then it just, down through the generations, and, until I was the last, the youngest student to go to school here. Before we had to close it, there were only three of us left. Time has taken its toll, however. An effort several years ago to save this building helped, but nothing lasts forever, especially if there isn't a solid roof on top of it all. The big thing here now is a roof is what protects any structure, and this roof had failed miserably uh, over the years of weathering and things, so now we've taken some steps to move forward uh, with fundraising to try and uh, put a new roof on. The school closed in the early 60s and is now lovingly called the Reese Creek Community Center. Turns out, it's always been that. We used to have community dances here. My grandparents had their 50th anniversary here. My parents had their 50th anniversary here. We had lots of uh, potlucks and, and showers and just all kinds of activities that the community attended. The ladies club met here. Just a lot of things happened here. And a lot of those activities can happen here again and for a long time in the future with just a little help. At the Reese Creek School and Community Center, Chet Lehman, MTN News. And you can help this weekend and enjoy a little community all at the same time. From 2 to 5 tomorrow, head out to the end of Spring Hill Road. Take your family, enjoy a barbecue, an auction. All the proceeds will go to the roof project. There'll also be some live music available as well. 2 to 5 tomorrow out at the Reese Creek School and Community Center. All right, time for a quick break here on Montana This